I, Sir Robert Alexander, embarked on my quest to discover the tombs of ancient Egypt to find the lost secrets and treasures of kings and queens long forgotten. Discarding fears of deadly curses, I set about unlocking clues to the past. The relentless search of Prince Amun had taken my expedition five years of toil. Finally, the tunnel leading to the burial chamber was unearthed. Our weary bodies, invigorated by excitement and trepidation, took the first stone step leading down to the tomb. James. Is this the tomb? It is. What can you see? The room's empty. Wait, there's another chamber. words of life, <laughs> capable of bringing the dead back to the living. Et incar et amrad kadar, est et rule, et rule, der 
kartí. Am tag čest untar šerí. Et inkar et amrad kadar. Eest eit rule der bukarti. Mr. Robert. Look. The mummy, it's alive! Get back! It wasn't just archaeologists who plundered the tombs of ancient Egypt. Filmmakers often did too. So join me, Edward D'Souza, as we unwrap the making of Hammer's mummy films. That ye may walk again the land of Chem in all thy strength and beauty, and wear once more... Linen-wrapped living dead have terrified film goers for decades, ever since Boris Karloff stepped out of his sarcophagus in Universal's The Mummy in 1932. And the poor archaeologist watching was left blabbering <coughs> insanely. He, he, he went for a little walk. <laughs> so successful was the picture in America that it spawned a whole series of films for Universal, starting with The Mummy's Hand in 1940, with cowboy star Tom Tyler playing Caris, The Mummy brought to life by a brew of Tana leaves. Pained with arthritis, Tyler relinquished the role to Lon Chaney Jr. for a further three adventures, ending with The Mummy's Curse in 1945. After the inevitable Abbott and Costello meet the mummy in 1951, the bandaged Avenger was finally laid to rest. Until someone else braved the ancient curse to revive him. And that revival would be in England. Hammer Films began in 1945 as the production arm of Exclusive Pictures, a family-run distribution company uh, run by the Carreras and Hines families. Taking few risks, they engaged upon big-screen adaptations of already successful radio and TV shows such as Dick Barton, PC-49 and The Lions Family. When I came out of the Air Force was for Hammer. They said it wasn't called Hammer in those days, it was called Exclusive Films. An assistant director and I worked I on about, the film was called Dick Barton. I mean, we used to make a lot of ex-radio shows. For some reason, we made radio shows. Uh, and I think I worked on about 30 of those. I became a production manager for Hammer. And this was extraordinary days, because it's in the movie business now as well as then. There was no such thing as regular employment. You work from a picture, picture basis. A permanent move to a house on the Thames at Windsor soon became their own cottage studio, Bray Studios which allowed them a unique repertory approach to filmmaking, and an early deal with Robert Lippert brought American leads into their films, guaranteeing distribution to the States that was lacking with other small independent companies. In 1957, they produced Britain's first colour horror film and the first colour adaptation of Frankenstein. Pairing Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, and directed with flair by Terence Fisher, The Curse of Frankenstein was released to great success. The following year, the same team was back with Dracula, and the result was even more dramatic. It broke opening day box office records in England over the May bank holiday, and continued its success on its international release. Co-financiers Universal International were particularly relieved when the cash-strapped company was saved from bankruptcy by the revenue raised in the wake of Dracula's roller coaster ride. I'll tell you one thing. Peter Cushing and I, and James Carreras and Tony Hines, the four of us went to America for the premiere of the first Dracula movie, which was an unbelievable experience for me. I'd never been to America in my life, 57. And the next morning they said, we have a date Universal Films. I know that's Universal. 
and we went to this building, we walked into this enormous office, and the president of Universal Films was an Australian called Al Daff. In this way, I think I attracted a lot more attention than a sales executive normally does. He got up, shook us by the hand, he made a remark I will never forget, because I checked with Peter Cushing and Jimmy Carreras and Tony Hines. I said, did this man really say that? And what he said was, gentlemen, your film has taken Universal out of bankruptcy. So grateful was the Hollywood major that it opened its doors to Hammer and allowed them remake rights of any of their back catalogue of horror films. Trade papers carrying the story announced that Hammer had chosen three projects. The Phantom of the Opera wouldn't take to the screens until 1962, and The Invisible Man would never materialise in Hammer's hands. It was the third project that went to the top of their programme, and in 1959, they produced their version of The Mummy. Writer Jimmy Sangster had already penned The Curse of Frankenstein and Dracula, and now plundered Universal's Mummy series for his latest story. Whilst Hammer's films were low budget, the films looked scrumptiously extravagant on screen thanks to the excellent production design by the team of Bernard Robinson and Dom Minge. I worked with Ted Marshall, who was one of the art directors, Ada Wills, quite a number of different people, and then came along Bernard Robinson, and we seemed to click together and we got on very well. We kind of ghosted him, in a sense, and he became my mentor. And now, the mummy really gave them something to get their teeth into. Andrew Lowe, an ex-production designer and ancient Egypt expert, was brought in to advise on the film, and the tomb was crammed with objets d'art designed by Lowe, Robinson and Minge, and built by Hammer's construction crew. One of the biggest influences was, of course, the treasures found in the tomb of boy king Tutankhamen. After the Hound of the Baskervilles, Cushing and Lee were back for their fourth Hammer thriller together. Cushing played hero John Banning, whilst Lee was hidden under the makeup of Roy Ashton. Australian-born and a professional opera singer, Ashton was another perfectionist and studied and sketched mummies at the British Museum in researching his design, and Lee gives a powerhouse performance, combining mime with tremendous empathy in his eyes, conquering with ease a number of deep emotions despite the incapacitation of his facial makeup. His hulking frame was also impressive, whether dragging himself out of a swamp to dwarf his guardian, played by George Pastel. The main problem with the mummy, which in a way I suppose is vaguely similar to the one with the creature uh, in Frankenstein, was that I couldn't say anything as the mummy, and I could only rely on physical impact, things I did, or the movements of the body, the holding out of the hands to the reincarnated princess, drops his arms like that and turns away and walks away. Now, in both those characters, the Frankenstein creature and the mummy, the acting is done with the body. So he smashes through the window, um, those doors, and he actually did that himself. Uh, sort of, I worked it out myself and uh, said it's fine, you know, have a go at it. Because he likes, if he can, he likes to get in there and do some of his own work. Coming through a window, uh, which wasn't too bad, but... Uh, and then, of course, the famous occasion when I had to go through a door into the room where Raymond Huntley was standing with Peter Cushing. And some genius put the chain on on the inside, not knowing, I suppose, that I was going to come through that door. So I, I ran at it, crashed through it, and virtually dislocated my shoulder. I tore the whole thing out from the wall. Stunt double Eddie Powell took over to cover shotgun blasts to the chest. So that I set off the charge myself. Of course, all this explosive charge and everything, it was quite hefty, you could feel it, but it was quite safe. Um, all the black 
It's like so, I was, underneath all the clothing, I was like sort of I'd gone black with soot and God knows what else. And uh, they had to wash me down in the wardrobe afterwards, which um, wasn't bad. <laughs> there is a scene in the Mummy where, because of my heresy, blasphemy, trying to restore the princess I was in love with. I'm warned up as a mummy. Before that happens, they cut out my tongue. But we did shoot it, I remember. But in some countries, they show that scene from the front. Now, in a lot of countries, that's not in. I know that. And then you do see blood coming out of my mouth. Mr. Bali would complain of back strain carrying Yvonne Fourneau through the bubbling swamp as he waded through the gas jets beneath. There were occasions when I had to carry these girls who'd fainted. And because they had fainted, they were dead weights. They couldn't put their arm around my neck to help me. And I had to carry them with my arms extended as dead weights. And the result was, of course, I pulled all the muscles in my neck and shoulders and everything, which was rather unpleasant. I saw this um, poster of the mummy striding through the countryside with a light coming through his body, you see. So I went to the uh, publicity farm and I said, uh, What's this? Um, I don't see anything about this light in the, in, in the script. He said, oh, no, they, they, they just just to sell the picture. So I go to Terry Fisher and I say, dear Terry, the old mummy and I have a, a, an awful uh, set too. Now, in my, my study, it's a character I'm playing, John Banning, has a harpoon hanging up on the back of my desk. And I can ram it right through old Chris Lee. And he just nonchalantly breaks the thing off and still comes at me. And it's, uh, it was wonderful. But at least it gave some sort of semblance of uh, reason for the light to be shining through his body. The film was successful on its London release at the London Pavilion. <laughs> However, it was five years before Hammer returned to ancient Egypt for Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. By now, things had changed at the House of Hammer. The Associated British Picture Company, or ABPC, were happy to give finance for Hammer films released on their circuit, but the cost was that Hammer were coerced into making more and more films at ABPC's own studio at Elstree, and this would be the home for their latest Mummy picture. The Daily Cinema in 1963 announced a very optimistic synopsis of the story. The curse of the mummy's tomb concerns a group of archaeologists on a routine expedition into the Sahara Desert, who discover an ancient tomb containing the mummy of a pharaoh. Dabbling in things they don't understand, they bring to life a monstrous 20-foot giant which goes on a murder rampage in Cairo. When the gigantic creature escapes into the desert, aircraft and parachute troops go in pursuit. The story did contain one ingenious twist, with the mummy's brother, played by a dastardly Terence Morgan, still alive and well and living in London, cursed with immortality. Terence Morgan, beware. Your past may catch up with you. <laughs> Only an amulet hidden amongst the treasures is capable of releasing him from it. Michael Carrera's story was not as grand as promised. Carreras was never that enthralled by Hammer's horror direction, preferring war films such as The Steel Bayonet and Ten Seconds to Hell, gritty police dramas such as Hell is a City, and big-budget adventures such as She and One Million Years B.C., but did have a soft spot for the mummy, and was therefore pleased when he was allowed to write, produce, and direct the latest in the series. Carreras appointed a friend, Bill Hill, as associate producer to share his producer's chores whilst he was directing. Beneath Roy Ashton's bandages, this time was the rather portly stuntman Dickie Owen. Ashton was able to learn from some of his mistakes in the previous film and created more air pockets in the mask, making it more comfortable to wear. Cheekily, Carreras took the name of Henry Younger as an in-joke against his fellow producer at Hammer, 
Tony Hines, who wrote films for Hammer under the name of John Elder. Tony didn't think The Mummy was serious enough. I mean, by this time, he's now steeped in the true gothics. And it's quite true, The Mummy is a little bit more uh, colourful and a little bit more adventurous. I liked, I liked doing it. Uh, in fact, the only horror films I ever personally made were The Two Mummies. I enjoy directing, of course, yes. I mean, I don't know anybody who wouldn't enjoy directing. <laughs> By 1966, Hammer would be engaging their last production of Bray, The Mummy's Shroud. The third film in Hammer's Mummy series, Hammer would brighten up the repetitive storyline with a whole compendium of deaths, ranging from skull crushing, burning by corrosive acid, to plain being thrown out of the window. The script was written by the film's director, John Gilling, based on a storyline by Hammer producer Tony Hines. Now, the mummy is that of Prem, head slave and guardian of the young Prince Kartu Bey. Prem is forced to flee with his young charge into the desert to escape his murderous uncle, but the boy perishes and is mummified in the sand, covered by the sacred shroud bearing, you guessed it, the secret words of life and death. This gave makeup artist George Partleton two mummies to design, but he took a shortcut, copying two that were residing at the London Museum. The desiccated mummy of Cartor Bay was impressively modelled on a similar mummy of a child, although the original shooting script described its appearance very differently. For the mummy of Prem, defender of the tomb, Partleton replicated a mummified Roman body that was filled by the boots of Christopher Lee's stunt double, Eddie Powell. He had recently married Hammer's wardrobe lady, Rosemary Burrows. This was Powell's first credited performance. One unpleasant moment came when he had to have acid splashed on his chest. The fumes went up into his mask, and unable to breathe, he had to rip the mask off to the chagrin of John Gilling, who was trying to capture the scene. Plus, terror from the tombs. See, Frankenstein created woman and the mummy's shroud. The film was shot back to back with Frankenstein created woman, and consequently the village from Frankenstein on the Brayback lot was disguised as the town of Matsera, for the mummy's shroud. The desert scenes were shot at a nearby quarry at Wopsy's Wood in Gerard's Cross, and consequently the film looks less studio-bound, and consequently less cheap than their previous mummy film. The cast was first class. André Morel gave his normal distinguished performance, but it is a shame that he ends up as the mummy's first victim. Catherine Lacey gives a gorgeous performance as the evil fortune teller, Haiti, who dribbling maliciously peers into the crystal ball to decide the fate of the expedition members. Her son is capably played by Roger Delgado, who later became notorious on BBC television in the early 70s as John Pertwee's evil adversary, the master in Doctor Who. Character actor, the versatile Michael Ripper, returns to a splendid role as Longbarrow, the belittled manservant, and many regard this as his best performance for Hammer. Hero David Buck replaced the intended John Richardson, who had starred in She and One Million Years BC. David was later to marry Hammer maiden Madeline Smith, but tragically died of cancer in February 1989. Prophetically, Elizabeth Sellers, who had starred in Hammer's first film at Bray, Cloudburst, in 1951, was now in their last Bray production. The final dissolution of The Mummy was filmed at special effects head Les Bowie's studio in Slough, 
where they completely reconstructed the set from Bray on a rostrum so that the technicians could work beneath. At the end, it's the arms and hands of assistant Ian Schoons that we see poking through the rostrum and crumbling a concoction of fuller's earth mixed with paint dust over a skull hiding underneath. It was a solemn day for Hammer when they finished their last day at Bray on Friday, October the 21st, 1966. As Bray was laid to rest, fans would peer over the fence to see the rotting remains of Metsara and a lost film heritage. 1970 brought sexploitation to Hammer. The British Board of Film Censors upped the bar of X-rated adult features from 16 to 18, and Hammer responded with an adaptation of Sheridan Le Fanu's novella, Carmilla, bringing nudity and lustful lesbian vampires to the screen in The Vampire Lovers. In 1971, Michael Carreras replaced his father as managing director at Hammer, the year opened with their final mummy adventure, and very different it was from the others. This was an adaptation of Bram Stoker's Jewel of the Seven Stars, although the title, Blood from the Mummy's Tomb, would betray Hammer's intentions. Its star, the buxom Valerie Leon, would also continue Hammer's preoccupation with leading young starlets in the 70s, a reputation that today has been labelled Hammer Glamour. I was thrilled to be working with Peter Cushing, who was cast as my father. And on the first day of shooting, we did a very important scene where he hands me the ring for my 21st birthday present, the ring which, in fact, he'd removed from the dead hand of Tera, the Egyptian queen. He was a lovely man to work with, a gentleman in every respect. This is what I recall of him in that brief time we had together. Leon played a dual role. Margaret, who was born at the precise moment her father, Professor Fuchs, opened the tomb of the evil Queen Terra. Now, Terra is to be reincarnated through Margaret. Ancient curses abide on desecrating the tombs of ancient Egypt, and Blood from the Mummy's Tomb was certainly a cursed film. Peter Cushing, was cast in the central role as Professor Fuchs. He'd completed his first day shooting on Monday the 11th of January and was released early because his wife Helen was ill and he lived in Whitstable. Cushing recalls in his autobiography, she looked tired when I got there in the evening, but comfortable enough. As I wasn't on call the next day, I promised I'd bring a little picnic lunch for us to have, as a change from hospital fare. She smiled and said that would be lovely. Arriving with a small wicker hamper containing smoked salmon and avocado salad, I went straight to her private ward and stopped dead in my tracks. Hanging over the glass peephole of the door was a notice. No visitors under any circumstances. Helen Cushing had relapsed with worsening emphysema. Knowing the worst, Cushing begged to be able to take her home. Helen Cushing passed away soon after at two minutes past nine on the morning of Thursday the 14th of January. I was really sad because obviously Peter Cushing being the name he was, it would have brought a totally different tone to the movie. Um, his role was taken over by Andrew Kerr, who was a lovely man also, but obviously played it in a completely different way than Peter would have done. Michael Carreras kept the production running without Cushing and desperately rang actor Andrew Kerr on the Friday, asking him to take over Cushing's role. Michael Carreras called me and said, Andrew, we're in trouble. Peter's wife has died. And uh, he tried to carry on, but they'd shot five days and he cracked up. So they rang me on the, the Friday night and said, you know, could you help us out and come in and do it? I said, of course. And um, I said, leave the script at the gate and I'll come down. 
Keir travelled down from his home in Wales, and on Monday morning they had a new Professor Fuchs. However, disaster was never far away from this doomed production. Scene 79 called for him to drag himself down the stairs, calling Margaret. The progress report for that day reveals the doctor was called to Andrew Keir as a result of a slight fall on the stairs of Interior Fuchs Hall. The report for the following day adds that Andrew Keir was x-rayed today and the result show that he has not damaged any ribs as a result of his fall yesterday. Despite the frantic rescheduling of Fuchs' role, Seth Holt managed to get the film online. But at the end of the fifth week of shooting, on Saturday 14th of February, Holt suffered a heart attack and died at the age of 47. He was an acclaimed movie director whose career had been halted by alcohol problems. This film was his brave comeback, although many noted his frailty on set. Also plagued by asthma, the last scenes he filmed were the sandstorm scenes on the stage at Elstree, where great wind machines blew a dense concoction of dust and fuller's earth around. It was difficult to breathe for anyone on set, let alone an asthma sufferer, but Holt, a professional to the end, insisted he was there to compose the scene. The cast and crew were obviously devastated. Bravely, Michael Carreras picked up the director's reins and, with the old adage, the show must go on, rallied the team together, and by Monday he was ready to continue. However, it was not easy. An ex-editor, Holt edited the film in his head as he went along, with the intentions of sitting down with his editor at the end of shooting to begin physical editing. Consequently, Carreras inherited reels of incongruous footage with no assembly cut or editorial notes to look at, which didn't help, and he described the script as very confusing. He also found Holt's editor, Oswald Hafenrichter, impossible to work with and replaced him with Peter Weatherly, with whom Carreras then worked hard to salvage the film. Despite these terrible setbacks, all was not doom and gloom, as there were lighter moments. The prop-crawling hand also caused some amusement when it continually broke down. Our director Scott McGregor had no problems in designing the sets for Terra's tomb. He had worked as one of the team of art directors on Cleopatra, as well as Khartoum. He was even reputed to have borrowed some of the Egyptian artefacts made for Hammer's previous mummy films, which still lay idle at Bray. As an in-joke to production supervisor Roy Skeggs and assistant director Christopher Neem, the sign hanging outside the house opposite the Fuchs home read, To Let, Apply, Neem and Skeggs. It was becoming all too much for Hammer as the house of horror began to crumble. As well as competing with their rivals, they were competing with themselves as two double bills were released on different circuits at the same time. In the name of Terra, she is back. To destroy those who helped to raise her evil flesh and blood from the mummy's tomb. Blood from the Mummy's Tomb went out with Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde on the EMI circuit as Twins of Evil went out with Hands of the Ripper through Rank's rival circuit. The new concept of horror brought by the Exorcist in 1973 was too much for the ailing company. And by 1979, Hammer was declared bankrupt and the Mummy and all its monster creations were to walk no more. I can remember
remember shooting on The Mummy at Bray Studios and Christopher Lee is playing The Mummy swathed in these bandages from head to foot gap in his mouth for breathing and eyes to see and nose nostrils and there's a scene within the film where he is pierced by a spear through his chest it comes out the other end and then there's going to be various shots within the scene so he's got to wear this now dummy spear for the rest of the scene which will take probably another couple of hours perhaps and there was a break for tea tea trolley had come on the set so like all of us we just joined in having a cup of tea and it was just funny to see Christopher having a cup of tea or a mug of tea um, with this walking around the set with a spear stuck through him and because he caught us giggling off the side and he turned around and said what are you laughing at just a funny moment I can remember. <laughs>